Hello. Hello. <laughs> That's I great. Like, I don't know how to do this with the comment section off. <laughs> <laughs> oh, how are you doing? Very good. All right, there we go. Sorry, we're, we're turning off the comment section so so we can you can see us and I know I was here yeah. I was like I don't know how to help I'm so sorry <laughs> like I kept trying to hit all the buttons and I was like it's not gonna let me do anything <laughs> all, we're all used to this 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 is our life now right which I is know. like half of every conversation is is figuring out how the conversation is going to actually exactly welcome to 2020 the year in which we all have to relearn technology ah, so fun so good <sighs> so how are you <laughs> Good, doing well. There is a rogue fly somewhere in my office and it has tried to buzz me like 30 times today. So if you see me go like that suddenly, it's because like, I'm pretty sure, there it is. It's been alive too long and I don't understand why it wants to cause me such emotional grief. But otherwise, good, how are you? Good, good. It is a, it is a cold, rain, rainy day here in October, um, here, in, here in New York. We have reached yeah. peak cold. <laughs> Which is, you know, because it's that, that point in time where it's actually cold because it's no longer summer, but yes. it hasn't come on. Yes. And I don't know if this is the same for you there, but here, and I didn't really, sorry, total digression. Um, here, when the heat comes on, it's that we all open our windows. Which, yes. From a, a, a cons energy conservation standpoint, but I didn't realize this until recently. This is apparently deliberate. It, it was because of the 1918 pandemic. Really? Yes. All the New York City building, like pre-war building, were yeah. so that you do, you're supposed to open your windows because it creates massive air exchange. They didn't have, you know, it wasn't like so many fans, right? You just, if your room is hot and yeah. you open your windows, the air rushes out. It makes sense. Yeah. Anyway. Oh. Ne the more you know, the more yeah. you know. It is just cold and dreary here in France, so we. I am. I am inside. I am. I have. I have company in the background. I love it. I'm so glad you pointed it out to me because there would have been a time, sometime in this chat, where you leaned to the side, and I then would have screamed and freaked right. out. <laughs> People can see it. That fly is just like an attention hog. So I apologize. <laughs> I will try not to be a distractible cat. Not visible so far. So Good. just assume that actually you're being haunted. Yes. By, you know, and I feel like now we've appropriately set the mood for a book. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. I am being haunted. It is not a fly. Yes. Um, so yes, what should we what should we start talking I about? I know. I've got this whole list here. Do you have the list? I do. We have all these wonderful questions. Um, you know, one thing, one thing that people were asking about, uh, specifically was spoilers versus no spoilers. I thought, why don't we start without spoilers? Yeah. Then maybe at the end we can do like a hand. We hand could hand. do like the last five minutes. And yeah. Then, then it, and then it'll drop to like 30 people who are here to be spoiled. <laughs> okay. So this is the spoiler free 95% yes. of the chat. Yes, exactly. Wonderful. Um, well, can I just ask you a question first? Sure. Okay, so let's see. Um, if you could live in, oh no, this, I, these, these other people's books is hard one though, because I feel like it puts on the spot. They, they did give us these questions. And I mean, actually, I do have an answer, which maybe not necessarily super smart answer. On yeah. I, would I don't know if I would live, in, but I would totally go to Red London. I would oh, that's a smart one. I if you had said White London from the Shades of Magic series, no. or anyone doesn't know, I would have had major questions about. Yeah. Whereas, what? like, I feel like I would be very happy in the world of Uprooted. Maybe it's just because, again, I go anywhere where there's magic yeah. and sorcery. But I'm like, yeah, I get that. I would take that in a heartbeat. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, the, of course, obviously, right, you could say, but imagine that we lived in one of these worlds and we were offered the chance this world yeah that, then we would be I, like yeah sure <laughs> right you know it's like you look at a laptop you look at this iphone that we're communicating with yes right it's, it's magic it's very just... much a grass is greener you know what it is i think one of the things that i love about magic is it feels like there's a natural balance to the cost and the reward in a way that so many times our world feels a bit arbitrary and obviously our world i mean we see this in the states right now like sometimes like it feels like evil reigns and there's very few checks and balances and you're like how does the world reorient whereas at least in worlds with magic i think we tend to be a little bit better 
about writing cost and reward. Well, and I'll, I mean, that's fairy tale, right? Fairy tales are all about justice. Yeah. You know? uh, and I think that's, children are really into justice. Um, and, and obviously sometimes it's not very nice justice. It's sure. children are vengeful, but, uh, but yeah. There's still a sense. All right. Um, here's a question uh, for you. Do you, oh, I don't know. The question was, do you think Addie could survive the Scalamance or L immortality if they swapped? Yes. I'm the person to say, I do not think Addie would be very happy at all in the Scalamance because Addie's actually like a very sweet person who really just like wants to be happy and comfortable. And yes. so I feel like the Scalamance is the exact opposite of happy and comfortable. I mean, I don't think anybody, I don't think anybody would be happy in the Scalamance. No. Uh, it's, I, I do, I don't know. I think Addie has that sort of determination to survive. She could, but she would certainly be miserable. I mean, she's, she would probably find the beauty in the monsters. Like she would find a way, or actually she'd be really good at like, I can't remember the word that you use for it, but like almost the masonry, the, um, like the ones who craft and create. Mm -hmm. uh, the yes. Yeah, the artifacts, the artifactors. Artifactors? Art, 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 art basers. Basers. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't, I, I write the words. I don't know actually how to pronounce it. Either. I think that Addie would be very good at that. Cause I mean, I mean, she can't obviously, but if we're going to put her curse aside, I like to believe she would be very good at that. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I can totally see that for Elle, you know, Addie's specific immortality since, you know, Elle is obviously already so isolated and so sorry for like the flashing no, you're fine. my screen up here um l i think probably couldn't survive that immortality i mean um because i think you know i think that when we she's already kind of at the at the limits of the amount of isolation that she can survive yeah. and um and I think she, she doesn't, Addie has a kind of, you know, long game. Yes. On, which Elle, I don't really, Elle is, does not have that kind of sort of patience. And also doesn't sort of, I think she's trying to survive. She's so focused on that survival um, that if there wasn't that sort of, that she's using the survival in a way, the imminent threat, the imminence of the threat, yeah. as part of her motivation to keep going. She also Which, knows there's a timeline, right? Like yeah. the whole thing is Elle's able to survive literal hell because she knows that there's an end point. Whereas like the whole aspect of Addie's immortality is that there's no end point until she quits. So I feel like our characters, Addie and Elle have been designed to survive the curses and constraints into which we have put them in a way that they are uniquely capable of doing such that they probably wouldn't do well in each other's curses. Well, and exactly, you know, that's sort of one of the wonderful things about writing fantasy, about writing speculative fiction in general, right, is that you build the world for your character or your story. Yeah. And it, the, two, the, two, the two lock together such a in such a wonderful way yeah story and character and conflict and world these are things which are created inextricably from each other yeah exactly mm -hmm. all right hold on i'm looking at the list yes um, um okay so what made you start writing what would me start I, um uh well you know it's not what actually made me start writing ever but um the inner light um star trek the next generation um, when I was a sophomore in college, we all hung out um, in, in uh, our dorm mates had, had a big room and we would all go there and watch Star Trek The Next Generation. And I think literally like one of the first episodes I saw, I, I don't actually swear to this, somebody can go online and like look at it here. Yeah. But this is how I remember it. So it's um, and I saw that episode and I was just like, wow, I need, to, I need to talk about this for longer than the people in my harbor will, will tolerate for me. And so I went online and found um, the Streckel bailing list on the on Brown's back CMS server and went in there and discovered fan fiction. 
and the people do it. I was like, I, I can do this. This looks like fun. What about you? Because I know you, um, you started with original things, right? Yeah, I actually started with poetry. I was probably 13, 14 when I was pretty serious about poetry. I wasn't serious about novel length work until I was in college, interestingly, because I was convinced I didn't have the attention span to write a novel. I would argue I, I still don't have the attention span to write a novel, so I do everything in my power to make it not feel like I'm writing a novel. I'm writing a series of short stories that are escalating episodes towards like, I just, I can't handle the pressure and the concept of keeping an idea in my head. No, I, I distinctly remember it was the only way I felt sane. Like writing poetry was the, sorry, I have a, there we go. I was like, of course, I just, ugh, I gotta stop that. Okay, poetry was the only way that I felt like I could excise so many of my emotions. <laughs> and like, I wanna be very clear, like very bad poetry as I feel like it should be. Right. But I began to be, I took myself seriously. And it was the first time that I took myself seriously and then other people began to take me seriously. And it was a validated effort. And so to have a catharsis, to find something that was good for me and healthy for me, and then to have other people say like, this is good, you can do this. Mm -hmm. Like I am somebody, I'm an only child. So I've always been based like all of my self-worth on external, <laughs> external <laughs> validation and internal discipline. And so, yeah, I just became really serious about it. And then I, I liked the concept of finishing something. I liked that electric thrill of finding a way to get a story entirely out of my head and onto paper. And I was hooked. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, that's, you know, it's sort of, um, that, that feeling of being that obviously that, that feel, the, you know, the, the first piece obviously is the right, the writing back is the thing that all have right that's that's one of the most important things that you can't you can't write well until you have written badly and so the first thing is to write badly and so that's obviously the first step and then but that sense of you know when you write and and you are you get that sense that other people want to read yeah it's yeah. addictive yeah um, it's addictive. And I know in fan fiction, you get that continuous mm -hmm. reinforcement on like a really short term basis, which is lovely. Yes. Uh, and, and it's, it's incredibly motivating. Um, and it makes you more and of course, then you get, you get better at it. I would also just say for anyone who's watching this, who wants to write and feels like, but I still feel like I write badly. Like, so do I, I would argue that a first draft, regardless of whether you're on your first project or your 20th project is still about writing badly so that you can figure out how to write it well. I, yeah, I guess I feel like you always, I would say, I don't tend to do a draft in that I'm, I'm just revising the whole time I go. Yeah. Uh, but that, that sense of you have to give yourself permission. Yeah. You, uh, you, have to, you have to take it or out to let the world really flowing and fast and let that energy, let that momentum build. And I find that for novels, I find that especially important. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And I guess, you know, it's uh, interesting because when I first wrote, the first thing I wrote the length was Temeraire. Yeah. And I remember, obviously, I've been writing fan for 10 years by then, but I just being absolutely terrified every minute that I was just going to scene and not finish it. Um, what was what was your? Oh, actually, no, I know your first novel. It actually um, the other day, the Near Wick. Yeah, I mean, it wasn't the first novel that I ever finished. It was the weirdly, it was the second novel that I ever finished. I wrote my first novel when I was nineteen. I like to describe it as Alice in Wonderland, but with more death and less plot, because that's exactly <laughs> what it was. And um, it was interesting because it was good enough to get me a literary agent, mm -hmm. but not good enough to get published. Thank God, because I did not know what I was doing. But I think the, my first literary agent saw potential in it because I came from poetry and I had figured out at 19, I was like, I bet, what if I took all these things I love about poetry and I find a way to put it into novels, like the cadence, the kind of hypnotic rhythm to everything and so I was able to get attention with it but thank god it it didn't get published but I think 
you know, it gets to another point that we talk about constantly as writers, which is if you want to be an author, you can write your whole life and not be an author and it's still totally valid. An author, when I talk about it, I just mean like, do you want this to be read by other people professionally? <laughs> like, do right. you want to create content for other people? Right. And I feel like um, to be an author, you just have to keep writing. Because if you publish, if you write a book and it doesn't go anywhere, you need to write another book. And if you write another book and it goes somewhere, you need to write another book. Right. So I just feel like all roads lead to keep writing. And as long as you keep writing, you're going to get there eventually. Yeah. 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 And, and then people will go and want to read your, your earlier works. Exactly. It's weird. I went to have the Near Witch published again. Like it was my first novel. And then it was like my 16th novel. And yeah. it was very surreal for people to find that book and not realize I had written that when I was like 21. Yeah. And then to just assume it was like, I wrote it last year and I was like, ah, oh, this is my, this is my canon out of order. Um, <laughs> all right, hold on. I'm looking at the questions. Yes. Other, some other questions. Um, what, yeah. Okay. What books and authors most influence your writing? Oh, so, you know, it, that's, there's so many. So I feel like, um, I, I, if I have to, I have to pick. It's like, who do you vote on? Yet? I know. Uh, Le Guin. I, yeah. I will go with Ursula. You know, I feel like you can go wrong. Um, yeah. with her. You? If you had to, if you had to pick one, if I had to pick one, probably Neil Gaiman. But mm -hmm. I feel like that's a. It's hard to. I mean, like I have a short list, right? It's like Neil Gaiman, Donna Tart, Susanna Clark, Aaron Morgenstern. Um, but yeah, like, I feel like it's a constantly revolving door. I'm influenced by everything that I read and everything that I love and everything that I don't love because it still tells me yes. what kind of writer I want to be and what I want to do differently. But yeah, I feel like it changes based on the day. But if I had to have like one author's work on my shelf that I could go back to as both inspiration and comfort read, it would be Neil Gaiman. Yeah, that's a, you know, I, um, you know what that, that made me think of was... Um, was just the the idea uh one thing that can be valuable though right is authors work that you don't love right and this is obviously one of the things that's super motivating in fandom right is that when you read something that is not perfect that is not aspirational like i want to literally write that thing yeah. um, I could write that I would, I, you know, it's more the, the inspiration of, uh, it, it, what, right? You go online, the mailing list of people like, oh, I can do this. Um, which I guess, actually, that's an interesting, for me, um, I have to say that until quite a slightly embarrassingly late period of time, yeah. um, I didn't kind of think that authors were people. Um, I, I, I sort of, I mean, I understand, yeah. There's no, yeah. but I sort of felt like, I don't know, it was, it was like this close weird thing. And I never, I never myself, like book signings, I didn't actually realize that that was a thing that you could do. Yeah. Did you but, think of them more like brands? A little bit. I, I don't know. I, it's more like I would pick up books and I just sort of thought, well, books are an artifact and they just exist in the universe and, and the universe just produces books. Yeah. Um, and obviously if you'd asked me, I would have said, Oh, oh yes, obviously somebody somewhere in a room wrote this, um, but I didn't quite believe it. <laughs> yeah. Did you feel like it was just like a team of people just like cobbling together words? So it was like a communal identity? Universe or something. Um, and I, I didn't quite understand this thing where like a book would be available, um, you know, where, got, where I would be reading a trilogy and I'd get to the end and then I'd be, where's the next one? And it wasn't available yet. Yeah, that's I, the I, worst. Yes, yes. I, oh, I, man. <laughs> well, it's true. There is like an emotional disconnect. And I feel like it's some of the best and the worst of social media is that it allows you to realize that your content creators are people. But there's also an expectation of like direct intimacy with those content creators, right? Like it's changed the entire nature. And in some ways, I'm so grateful for it because it's like, yes, hello, I am person. And I feel like one of the reasons that Addie has been received the way that it's been, Addie LaRue, which is, it's got a long title, um, that that's been received the way it's been is because so many people on the online community have been able to watch me for the last eight to 10 years creating this thing. And so 
it's interesting because it allows you not just a direct window into authors, but into the creative process that grows the stories, which is a weird thing to think about that like I have readers who have been with me since the near witch. And so they have watched the entire creative roller coaster decade that led to this book. And I was like grateful to be able to give them a window. But there's also a, a strange communal ownership and communal ownership is a really great thing and a very stressful thing, I think, as a, as a writer sometimes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I do think so, right? You know, you have to, um, so do you feel like you are, you are happy sort of working in public in a way? You try to do that yourself in a certain sense? I mean, I think I did it intentionally. I didn't stumble into transparency. I was transparent on purpose for two reasons. One is so that readers could have a bit of an understanding of what goes in, that there is an author, right, behind the curtain. But I more did it for writers. I did it because when I was coming up and I was really young, I mean, I got my agent when I was 19, like it was desperately lonely. And when we only talk about the positives of the creative process, if you're having a hard time, it can feel like a qualitative assessment, right? Like, well, if you're struggling, it must be because you're a bad writer and not because guess what? Writing's hard, especially when you factor in human, human, humanizing and like mental health and all these things. So I chose to be transparent just so that primarily so that other creatives who are struggling would feel less lonely in that process. But the weird side effect of it has been that my readers also get that insight into what goes into my creative process. And so they have a stake in seeing the end result, which is a thing I never really predicted, but I'm extremely grateful for. Mm -hmm. I don't know, That's you come from fandom, which is like, I feel like has a sense of communal identity already. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I guess the odd thing is that I, um, I feel like I don't generally, um, I mean, part of the problem is that my own sort of attention span, sorry, I'm like my screen. You're I'm, fine. So it blank. <laughs> um, my own sort of when I'm working, when I'm in flow, I don't want to. I mean, I don't want to talk to my family much like, like anybody else. Yeah. Right? You know that that when that is happening, when that when I'm actually working, actually writing, um, I I literally I'm like goodbye world. You know the the list of like. Errands piles up, the, the house is clean, the, you know, it's like too many tape orders, um, all that stuff. And, um, and so I can't, so I, I never sort of, and because I have like feast or famine, right, where either I'm, I'm like crazy full tilt full out, or I'm sort of like dribbling out this and that, in which case, um, yeah, so I've never actually done it sort of in, uh, I've never sort of thought about kind of, um, kind of just sort of going, doing it along, doing it public, um, yeah. in a way, but now I'm sort of thinking that it would be fun to do something like, um, I don't know, I, I don't know if you ever do this, I do tomorrow's every so often, you uh, do what? writing. Um, Pomodoro technique is basically- Oh, Pomodoro, yeah, sorry. You cut out really briefly. Yeah, 25 minute sprint. Right, exactly. Um, that it might be fun to do sprints like that in, uh, with people online. Oh um, man, see that stuff, does, that scares me. Cause I'm like a really neurotic process based writer. Like I'm happy to check in and tell readers how I'm feeling or like how I'm struggling or what I'm succeeding with. But I also am very productive about the actual time that I'm writing. Like the time that I'm writing, I like, I don't even do group sprints with my friends, like with other authors. I'm like, you do you. Like I, because I think I also don't measure word count. I just measure time. And I feel like as other people start to measure word count around me. I'm like, like, like NaNoWriMo, I'm going to be there to cheerlead and support everyone. But I also can't work that way because I could spend, you know, 50 hours working on the thing, but I can't spend 50,000 words. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. You know? Understand that I, um, for me, it's more that sometimes when, you know, at least lately, right, I, I'm, I'm in that sandwich place, you know, and there's always something, there's always some kind of external thing demanding my attention, trying to drag me away from, away from writing, away from work, 
and um, and that and that rhythm of the Pomodoros is very helpful, but oh. the rhythm. And so having somebody else who'll be like, all right, I'm in, let's go. Right? That's accountability, buddy. You need yeah. accountability, buddy. Yes, yes. Yeah. So maybe I didn't like make the internet accountability. I love, you can absolutely make the internet hold you accountable. <laughs> that is what it's there for. That'd be, that'd be great. Except then I, then editor could probably go online and how much time I have been. Spent. Yeah, that's the dangerous thing. You're like, I tend to go like very internet silent when I'm behind on deadlines so that yeah. my editor can't be like, it's interesting because I did just see you on Instagram. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's, that's the problem. Right? Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> let's let's go see. back to some of these, some of these wonderful questions. Um, there's a, this, this is a fun one going back. What was the first story you ever recall writing or from books or my um, I wrote a story, a short story when I was 13, uh, somewhere between 11 and 13. I don't remember exactly when my childhood is a blur, um, about two brothers who were angels, one, the angel of life and one, the angel of death. And the angel of death got very jealous because everyone kept worshiping his brother and nobody appreciated the work that he did. And so he murdered the angel of life. <laughs> and then thought, like, now everyone will appreciate me. But unfortunately, without the angel of life, the entire world just died around him. And so there was nobody left to appreciate his works. Wow. That, that, that was the first story that I remember writing. All right. That was, that was. What about you? Yeah. Um, the first story that I recall writing, um, I'm trying to think if this was, you know, I wrote a lot of, of things for, like, D&D. &D. Mm -hmm. um, stories they didn't have the shape of stories and I did write 150 pages long of a fantasy novel when I was 10 wow I on a clipboard at school when I should have been doing other work and like you know it, it was a it was showing off it was totally just like look at me right but um but I was I was still I, I don't remember a single word of it so it doesn't count for recall I do remember when I was a 16 or 17, my first sort of true Spanish experience, um, I had a friend in high school who was into fantasy, and we watched a made-for-TV movie mm -hmm. based on the Lloyd Webber musical where um, they, they were singing Faust, um, which actually will, I will use this to bring this back to the books, um, and I wrote, I wrote like three pages on so a monochrome monitor, the home computer, um, gone. I love it. Lost to, to bust. I there. love it. I love it. But all right. So actually, let's now that I've been talking about that, let's talk about let's talk about the. <laughs> oh man, is this the spoiler section of the chat? No, I don't think this is spoilers. Right? I think this is this. Is okay. Mental, right? Both. Yeah. Both this are is fundamental. Right. So, so the Scalamans, obviously, the, the original folk legend of the Scalamans, yeah, is of uh, a school run by the devil, where ten pupils come in and the, the last grab, um, keeps the last one, and I'll let you, you describe that. Yeah, and at, in Addy Larue, my devil is actually an old god. He's a god of night, a god of promise. Um, he is. We call him the devil, but that's a new word for an old idea. And he is summoned by Addie LaRue at the edge of the woods one night to make a deal for her soul. And, and what I love about writing him is that he's a god with a lowercase g, which means I could make him as flawed and as selfish and as petulant and as self-serving as I wanted. And so that's exactly what I did with him. So he is the devil and he is very much not the devil. Right. Um, he's not your biblical devil, certainly. And uh, yeah, I've never had as much fun writing uh, something close to a love interest. I won't call him a love interest because that's complicated. But yeah. yeah. Um, so tell me, what are you, what do you feel like are your inspirations for what what are the things the, the stories about kind of deals with the devil um, or anything that fascinated you about it that that made you. Well, I was mostly, I was most, well, I was mostly interested in the fact that, like, when we, when we read about deals with the devil, 
like so often it's men and yeah. they then like wander the world getting bored right they live for hundreds of years and they do everything there is to do and see everyone there is to see and screw everyone that there is to screw and then they like give into existential self-loathing and so i thought to myself what would a faustian bargain Oop. Oh, we split up hold on are you there I can hear you, but not see you. How strange. Hmm. Hold on. You frozen. There we go. Um, yeah. But like, what would a Faustian bargain look like if it was with a, for a woman? Mm -hmm. And like, specifically a woman who has that bodily autonomy stripped away and that identity stripped away and also has to deal with the historical precedence that she's still a woman <laughs> moving through the world alone. And what does that look like? And so it was more like pushing against the Faustian deals that I had read about. Mm -hmm. um, and trying to carve my own Faustian bargain with its own set of rules. I guess we have to like wrap this up, right? Oh, Is it... oh, uh, no, we have until 4.30, don't we? Do we? Am I, I, am I completely... Hold on, hold on, I'm checking this. Hold I'm... on. Hey, um, uh, this is me checking our event details. Um, keep talking, I'm just pulling up emails. Um, all right, <laughs> I, I too have asked, I don't know. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm trying to see I didn't. It's 30 minutes, 30 minutes. All right. So, yeah, yeah. so let's, 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 um, like Amy, thought... what are you working on now? Uh, book two, um, I'm almost done, uh, you know, but, but it's, it's, what's it called and when does it come out? Um, I, I'm not sure if I'm allowed. No, I, I it's the last <laughs> I was gonna say the title. I saw it online, so I mean, yeah. I knew it wasn't asking a foul question. This is the thing. I don't. I don't actually know anything about. Them. I don't know when they, when they tell. I know. I know them when I decide on them. I don't know when when they actually get there. Yeah. And when yeah. does it come out? Um, sometime next. <laughs> All right. Great. It's coming yeah. out less than a year after the first book. Yes. Yes. That's what I know about. Right. <laughs> right. And what about you? Um, well, I have the third book in my City of Ghosts series coming out in March, my middle grade series. And then I also have the extraordinary comic set in the vicious and vengeful world. And I have Threads of Power, which is the next arc in my Shades of Magic fantasy series. Oh, excellent. That's great. And now I guess we both better get back to work. Yes, clearly. <laughs> so thank you all so much for joining us. I'm so sorry we didn't get to all um, which were wonderful. We and must always leave them wanting more. <laughs> absolutely. All right. Don't don't make any deals with the devil. That's no. Moral. Nor you. Nor you. Yeah. Have a great rest of your night. <laughs> you too. Take care. Yeah.